Welcome to Music History Monday for November 28, 2022. I'm Bob Greenberg, and the title for today's podcast is Aaron Copeland in New York. If you haven't already, please consider joining me on my subscription site at patreon.com slash Robert Greenberg Music, where I blog, vlog, podcast, pontificate, review, and bloviate four to six times a week. We mark the New York premiere on November 28, 1925, 97 years ago today, of Aaron Copland's Music for the Theater at a League of Composers concert conducted by Serge Kusevitsky at New York's Town Hall. The actual world premiere of the piece took place eight days before when Kusevitsky conducted music for the theater in Boston. But Copeland was a native New Yorker, and music for the theater is about the New York theatrical and musical world. So, and for this You'll have to excuse me, particularly the Beantown Babies among us. The so-called Boston premiere was nothing but a warm-up, a preview, a promo, an hors d'oeuvre akin to trying out a Broadway play in New Haven or Philadelphia before taking it to the house, to the big time, to the apple, to the city that never sleeps, to the burg so big they had to name it twice, New York. New York. Coming clean. We all have to make decisions, the vast majority of which are, gratefully, relatively insignificant. I cannot imagine having to make decisions that would affect the health and welfare of entire communities. It's difficult enough for me to figure out what to make for dinner. The decisions I do make are for myself and for my families, my immediate family and my Patreon family. Here's a decision I made for my Patreon family two weeks ago today, on November 14th. You see, November 14th is one of those crazy dates when so much happened in the world of music that I was hard to put to decide what to feature in that day's Music History Monday. Check it out. On November 14, 1719, the composer, violinist, teacher, and tennis father supreme, Leopold Mozart, father of you-know-who, was born in the German city of Augsburg. On November 14, 1778, the composer and pianist Johann Nepomuk Hummel was born in the city of Pressburg, today Bratislava, the capital of Slovakia. On November 14, 1805, the composer and pianist Fanny Mendelssohn Hensel was born in the German city of Hamburg. On November 14, 1831, the Austrian-French composer and piano builder Ignaz Josef Pleil died in Paris at the age of 74. On November 14, 1900, the composer Aaron Copland was born in Brooklyn, New York. On November 14, 1939, the composer and synthesizer virtuosa Wendy, don't call me Walter, Carlos, was born in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. On November 14, 1946, the Spanish composer Manuel de Falla died in Alta Gracia, Argentina, at the age of 69. And finally, on that very day two weeks ago, November 14th, 2022, the wonderful Roberta Flack, born 1937, revealed that she is suffering from ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, and is no longer able to sing. Heavens, and to think that on some dates, Nothing happened. Okay, when deciding what to write about two weeks ago on November 14th, I was able to knock a couple of names off this list. 
My Music History Monday post for June 18th, 2018 celebrated the birth of Ignaz Pleyel, 1757 to 1831. And Music History Monday of October 17th, 2022, six weeks ago today, noted the death and celebrated the life of Johann Nepomuk Hummel. As it turned out, I chose to feature Fanny Mendelssohn Hensel in my Music History Monday post of November 14th past and in my Dr. Bob Prescribes post on November 15th. I was comforted in making this decision by the fact that I knew I'd be writing about the November 14th birthday boy, Aaron Copeland, in today's Music History Monday and tomorrow's Dr. Bob Prescribes post as well. Aaron Copeland in New York? The question mark attached to the post title, as just spoken, is appropriate. Because as a native New Yorker who lived the great bulk of his life in that singular town, we might rightly wonder, when was Aaron Copeland not in New York? In fact, the title of today's post refers to two very specific periods of Copeland's life in New York, his childhood, and the period after his return to New York in 1924, after three years of study abroad, primarily with Nadia Boulanger in Paris. For immigrants like Copeland's parents, the New York of his childhood was as much an idea as it was a place, the idea being that of the promised land, where a person's worth was measured by merit and not birth, where they and their American-born children, like Aaron Copeland, had freedoms and opportunities unthinkable in the old country. Musically, the New York of the 1920s was a home to everything. Symphony halls, opera houses, and conservatories abounded. The International Composers Guild founded in New York in 1921, and the League of Composers, founded in New York in 1923, competed with each other in presenting the most current and exciting new music. The New York-based American Musical Theater flourished as never before. Showboat of 1927, with music by Jerome Kern and lyrics by Oscar Hammerstein II, set an entirely new standard from musical theater in America. Dance halls, vaudeville theaters, nightclubs, and musical venues of every sort could be found literally on almost every block. On top of all of this, in those heady post-World War I years, years that saw the United States emerge as a superpower, there was a belief among many that America should cultivate its own art. As such, blues, ragtime, and jazz became part of the American artistic mainstream during the 1920s, a mainstream centered in the New York-based media. George Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue received its premiere in a concert entitled An Experiment in Modern Music on February 12, 1924, four months before Copeland returned from Europe to New York, there to build his career as a composer. The newly repatriated Copeland was nothing if not a person and artist of his time, and his self-avowed mission was to create a distinctly American sort of concert music based on jazz, blues, and the music of the American musical theater. The first of Copeland's major works to employ what he called the idioms of jazz, blues, and theatrical music was his music for the theater, which received its New York premiere 97 years ago today. How the Brooklyn, New York-born Copeland became a composer and then came to compose such a piece as music for the theater makes for a fascinating story, one that will now be told across the remainder of this post and tomorrow's 
Dr. Bob prescribes. Aaron Copeland, 1900 to 1990, a child of immigrants. He was born on November 14, 1900, in Brooklyn, New York. His parents were both Jewish immigrants from Lithuania, then part of the Russian Empire, though we would observe that they met in New York and not in the old country. Copeland's father, Harris, born circa 1860, lived till 1945, was the son of a furrier. He left his native town of Shavli sometime in the mid-1870s to avoid conscription in the Russian army. He arrived in Brooklyn in 1877, having traveled through Glasgow and Manchester. It was while in Scotland or England that he anglicized his family name from Kaplan to Copeland, spelled C-O-P-L-A-N-D, with no E after the P. Having arrived safely in New York, Harris Copeland saw to the immigration to New York of the rest of his family, his two brothers and five sisters, and his parents, Aaron Copeland's paternal grandparents, Sussman and Frieda, who kept the name Kaplan. Aaron Copeland later said that his paternal grandparents' stories about the hardships in Russia slash Lithuania, quote, left an indelible impression, unquote, on him. Most of the Copeland clan, including Aaron's father, became merchants and store owners. Aaron's mother, Sarah Mittenthal, circa 1860 to 1944, came from a small Lithuanian town called Vishtenets, near Kaliningrad. Along with her mother, Bertha, Sarah joined her father, Aaron, and his brother, Ephraim, in Chillicothe, Illinois. Unlike the Copeland family, who were urban merchants, Sarah's father and uncle were itinerant peddlers who sold their wares across the Midwest and Southwest of the United States. Sarah attended elementary school in Peoria, Illinois, and high school in Dallas, Texas. To her dying day, she considered herself a Texan. Most of the Mittenthals ended up in Dallas, one of Sarah's cousins, Herbert Marcus, co-founded Neiman Marcus. In 1881, Sarah and her immediate family moved to New York, where they settled in the Bronx. It was in New York that she met Harris Copeland. They were married in 1885, at just about the time he founded and opened what became a most successful department store at 62 Washington Avenue in Brooklyn, called H.M. Copeland's. Aaron Copeland described the store as, quote, a kind of neighborhood Macy's, unquote. It was in the three-floor apartment above the store that Harris and Sarah made and raised their family, which eventually numbered five children, Ralph, Leon, Larine, Josephine, and lastly, Aaron. Copeland's parents were your prototypical hardworking immigrants, and the store was a true family business. Copeland's mother, Sarah, actively partnered with her husband in running the store. She did the bookkeeping, did much of the buying, and designed the store's displays. All five Copeland kids helped out in the store, from working in the stockroom to manning the cash register. Copeland's family life was shaped by a culture of hard work and pride. Pride in their accomplishment and pride in the country that had given them such extraordinary opportunity. Copeland wrote, quote, My father was justifiably proud of what he had accomplished in the business world, but above all, he never let us forget that it was America that had made it all possible, unquote. Aaron Copeland 
experienced the American dream firsthand. You know, it's a story that many of us can identify with, myself included. My paternal grandfather, Samuel Greenberg, 1891 to 1973, who went by the name of Sidney, go figure, was born in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and grew up in Brooklyn. His parents, my great-grandparents, had emigrated from what today is Belarus in the 1880s. And my grandfather was, like Copeland, a first-generation American Jew growing up in Brooklyn. Like Copeland's parents, my grandfather's parents spoke Yiddish at home, particularly when they didn't want the kids to know what they were talking about. But my grandfather, by his own admission, refused to speak Yiddish with his parents. He was proud to be a Yankee, to have been born in America, the promised land. And if the streets were not actually paved with gold, they were at least paved, and his opportunities were truly unlimited. I would hazard to say that there are few more patriotic Americans than first-generation Americans, who, despite being born American citizens by birth, are still all too aware of what their lives might have been had their parents not had the moxie and tenacity to pick up and leave their native countries. Certainly, that statement is true for my grandfather, who flew the flag at every opportunity. It was true as well for Harris and Sarah Copeland. According to their son, loyal Americans and staunch Democrats, as well as their youngest son, Aaron. Copeland's Early Musical Education more than any other individual, it was Copeland's sister, Larine, spelled L-A-U-R-I-N-E, but pronounced Larine, eight years his senior, who sparked his interest in music. She had studied voice and piano and was competent enough to entertain her family and friends performing ragtime and popular songs and accompanying her brother Ralph on the violin. It was Laureen who began teaching Aaron how to play the piano when he was seven. Likewise, it was Laureen who taught him how to dance and later how to drive. That Aaron was gifted was clear from the first. Regarding his lessons with his sister, he remembered, quote, From the start, I was always arguing with her about how I should play, unquote. Those arguments didn't last for long because it took Laureen all of six months to teach Aaron everything she knew about the piano. Laureen approached their father and asked him to find a professional teacher for young Aaron. But Harris Copeland balked. He claimed that he'd already wasted enough money on music lessons for Aaron's four older siblings. It took Aaron six years to convince his father to buy him lessons. Aaron was 13 years old when Harris Copeland finally relented and agreed to pay for piano lessons, provided Aaron find his own teacher. That piano teacher was a local named Leopold Wolfson, who had a studio at 345 Clinton Avenue in Brooklyn. Copeland studied with Wolfson from 1913 to 1917. Wolfson was typical of his breed, a pianistic pedant who put young Copeland on a strict diet of keyboard exercises, Chopin waltzes, and sonatas by Mozart and Beethoven. Copeland remembered him as being, quote, a competent instructor with a well-organized teaching method. Chopin was the highlight of his life, and Stravinsky was a madman." Unquote. During his years with Wolfson, Copeland attended the Boys High School in Brooklyn, from which he graduated in June of 1918. Meanwhile, back at the age of eight, Copeland had begun improvising tunes at the piano. By the age of 12, he had begun to notate his improvised melodies. 
By 16, he was beginning to compose, but he hit a wall. He knew next to nothing about harmony, and the mail-order harmony course he obtained turned out to be as useless as we would suppose such a thing to be. At the recommendation of his piano teacher, Leopold Wolfson, Copland began composition lessons with Reuben Goldmark, 1872 to 1936, in 1917, during his senior year of high school. Reuben Goldmark was the real deal. A native New Yorker, he had studied at the Vienna Conservatory and at the National Conservatory in New York City, where he took composition lessons with none other than Antonin Dvorak between 1893 and 1895. A well-known composer in his day, Goldmark chaired the Department of Music Theory and Composition at the Juilliard School from 1924 until his death in 1936. Among Goldmark's other students, albeit briefly, was another teenage kid from Brooklyn named Jacob Gershevitz, who soon enough found fame and fortune under the name of George Gershwin. Goldmark's instruction did the trick, and almost all at once, Copland's prodigious compositional potential became clear to everyone, including Copland's father, who bought him a six-foot Steinway grand piano in 1919. Aaron studied with Goldmark from the fall of 1917 until the spring of 1921, foregoing college in order to continue his weekly lessons. Copeland expressed his gratitude toward Goldmark to his dying day, quote, for the solid basic training he gave me, unquote. There was an aspect of Goldmark's musical personality that did not impress itself on the young Aaron Copeland, and that was Goldmark's conservatism and his overriding reverence for the German musical tradition. Regarding Goldmark's conservatism, Copeland observed that he had, quote, little sympathy for the advanced musical idioms of the day, unquote. Copeland told the story of spying a copy of Charles Ives's second piano sonata, the Concord Sonata of 1915, on Goldmark's piano. Copeland asked his teacher if he could borrow it. Goldmark's response, according to Copeland, was, quote, You stay away from it. I don't want you to be contaminated by stuff like that. Unquote. Apropos of his reverence for German music, Goldmark himself wrote, quote, Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, and Wagner were Germans to the everlasting credit of their people all my life. I have regarded their works as the universal property of mankind." Unquote. Copland's musical tastes ran elsewhere, however. Those markedly non-German musical tastes were reinforced by the anti-German spirit felt in the United States during World War I, 1914 to 1918, and immediately after. Instead, the young Copland adored the music of Chopin and Verdi, of Grieg and Tchaikovsky, whose music he deemed ravishing, and of Mussorgsky and Scriabin, whose music Copland said was exceptionally fine. But more than any other contemporary, it was Claude Debussy, 1862 to 1918, whose music captivated the young Copeland, a captivation that preconditioned him towards France and French music. In 1920, Aaron Copeland decided that he would indeed finish his musical education in France. Having composed his final graduation piece for Reuben Goldmark, a traditional piano sonata, Copeland packed his bags and, in June of 1921, sailed for France. He expected to be gone a year. In fact, he would be away for three years. He would return a fully formed composer and to almost immediate acclaim. 
when we return in tomorrow's Dr. Bob Prescribes, it will be with Copeland's experiences in France, his triumphant return to the United States, and the creation of his first mature masterwork, Music for the Theater of 1925. Until then, thank you. To sample and download one or all of my many courses on subjects musical produced by The Great Courses slash The Teaching Company, please visit my website at robertgreenbergmusic.com.